Welcome to the Rural Recharge, a podcast of the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. Rural Recharge is a guided conversation that allows you to cut through the noise and multitude of information out there. You should be able to trust your sources, which is why we're a platform that comes straight from the source, the farmers and ranchers growing what we eat, wear, and use every day. Well, welcome to this edition of the Rural Recharge Podcast, and thank you for joining us today. Our guest today is my friend, Dr. Scott Engel. He is a Senior Vice President of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Uh, Dr. Engel is a national leader in developing this, the science that supports food production and management of natural resources as a chief executive of the Agriculture and Environmental Sciences arms of a leading land-grant university, he champions public science as a path to improve lives and reduce human suffering. His accomplished career in government, nonprofit international development, and academia informs an approach to leadership based on service, partnership, and drive for impact. An innovator who holds seven patents, Angle has successfully guided multiple organizations through budget shortfalls and other challenges. Dr. Angle leads nearly 2,300 employees who work at, in all 67 Florida counties. UFIFAS encompasses the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the Co Florida Cooperative Extension Service, and the Florida Agriculture Experiment Stations. Uh, Dr. Angle is a scientist, a teacher, a leader. He's trained in soil microbiology and chemistry. He provides an objective, fact-based analysis for all stakeholders. I'm impressed with his knowledge, his vision, his leadership, and I tell you, he is very well respected in our ag community and by me personally. Also, just recently, Dr. Engel, you were uh, announced by Dr. or by Dr. and President Ben Sass to be the interim provost for University of Florida. Congratulations on that, and welcome today. Well, thank you. Um, Glad to be here. Um, appreciate your friendship. Appreciate the support of the Farm Bureau. Uh, these are good partnerships that agriculture needs to be a team, especially in a state like Florida that's so diverse. That if we're not all working together, um, it's not going to go nearly as well. And so the relationship that we have developed and the partnerships between our staff, I think, are invaluable and good for the whole state. Well, I tell you what, it is wonderful. Well, today, just tell us a little bit how you came to the University of Florida. There was you've had a, a long history of a lot of experience, and give us a little background of how you can't ended up at the University of Florida. Um, I I grew up in the city, uh, literally Baltimore City, and had no vision of agriculture. I was never in 4-H, never in FFA, had no background at all. But I liked to play golf, and I thought I was pretty good. I went to uh, the University of Maryland as a student thinking I could become a, uh, be on the golf team. Well, I quickly learned that as good as I thought I was, I really wasn't. <laughs> uh, so my next choice was, well, I'll be a golf course superintendent. Mm -hmm. And that was taught in the College of Agriculture at the University of Maryland. So I went to the, the ag school there, studied agriculture, uh, turf management. I graduated with a degree in that, went on for a master's degree in turf management, but I gradually just drifted over into what I ended up being as a career a soil scientist and working on nutrients in soil. From there, I was a professor at the University of Maryland after I got my PhD in Missouri, professor for a long time. Um, then went to the University of Georgia, where I was the dean of agriculture there for a decade. From there, uh, I actually lived in Africa for a couple years. There I ran a very large nonprofit that worked on helping some of the poorest farmers of the world just grow more food. To, they were sustain, uh, um, helping them sustain livelihoods by just growing enough food to stay alive yeah. um, and help people actually grow a little more food so that you could sell something in the market and then send a kid to school or buy some health care or, or buy better food. I got called by the previous Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, to come back to the U.S., where I was the head of NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agricultural Food and Agriculture, for a couple of years, and did my time in D.C. Felt like I was a public servant for uh, long enough, at federal level, 
And so when the job here at Florida came open, I applied for it and was lucky enough to get it. I will say this is the best job I've ever had. I'm thrilled to be in a state like Florida that is just agriculturally is just so complicated, which I find fascinating. I would. I don't think I want to be in a state where they only grow corn and soybeans <laughs> and hogs. You know, we've got 300 plus things that we produce in Florida, and so I can't think of a better place to be if you're in agriculture than Florida. Well, you you talk about it. We you know we're unique in that we have over 300 commodities that we produce, and but in your role, what do you see are some of the biggest opportunities and or challenges for agriculture in the state of Florida with those 300 plus commodity commodities? So. Th- I think being a farmer in Florida is probably more difficult than any other state. I was in California last week. They grow a lot of the same things we grow here in Florida. But low humidity, the, the water is controlled. Now, they don't have enough of it, so a lot right. of fallow land out there. Uh, fewer insects, fewer weeds. Just everything there seemed easy to me compared to Florida, where mm-hmm. we have a new invasive species every couple of weeks coming into Florida. And right. the insects and the diseases and... Uh, then you add population growth and water issues. I, I, I truly don't think there's uh, anywhere in the country that is more complicated than Florida to try to grow more food. But we have to. We have to produce more food. There are things that we can do in Florida either that nowhere else can do in this country or we can do it at certain times of the year that others can't. So we have to grow food in Florida and we have to grow more of it because of the population. So how do you make all this happen with so many people and so much diversity and, and you know, the differences in soil, I'm a soil scientist, so the differences in soils between Homestead and Pensacola and the climates that are so different, climatic zones and crops and even people and culture, they, they tend to do things differently in different parts of the state. So with that, it brings great opportunity. I think that we can do a lot here that other states can't do, but it brings great challenges as well. It, it's truly going to take more knowledge, more technology, more understanding in Florida than anywhere else in the country to be successful. And that's interesting, too, because technology is something that you've been very much on the forefront of and visionary of is in implementing technology and especially artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is something that you are working on. I know you've worked on some grants to bring here from the, from USDA, uh, likewise to to dedicate staff and infrastructure to uh, AI. Uh, AI has some negative connotations nationwide as well, but some very positive ones from an agricultural standpoint. Can you share with us what, what your vision is in regard to AI and its, and its implementation and share with the audience a little bit about what the plan is because I think maybe a lot of folks aren't uh, aware of what's going on with the University of Florida and artificial intelligence. Uh, Sure, and we certainly need to be careful with artificial intelligence that it can be misused quite easily, and so there are a lot of people who think about that. But in agriculture, I don't think it's I don't think we have quite the um, those types of issues that we would have. You know, maybe if you're in justice or law or or even medicine, our 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 uh, our issues are a little more straightforward. Um, But here here's some of the issues that we face. Uh, we're losing labor in Florida, Absolutely. as we all understand. Regardless of what they do in Washington, D.C., or even in Tallahassee, our labor supply is disappearing. So how do we grow more food with fewer people? Uh, the answer is obvious. Um, it's not easy, but it's obvious, and that's that we need machines in the field doing a lot of this work. So we've always had good robots, that dumb robots, that could do certain types of things in the field. But everything else needs to be uh, connected up with instant decision-making. And it's only been about two years now where we had, whether it's through um, artificial intelligence or um, machine learning, but having real-time decision-making capabilities. So it's something that's that's literally brand new where we can now run a a, a spray rig through a, a field, identify the weeds, identify the crop and only spray the weeds and we can spray it with just with the right pesticide you know every weed can get a different pesticide applied to it we can reduce pesticide use by 75 percent we get um, you know a lot less impact on the environment lower the cost to the farmer and ultimately these technologies are going to get cheaper they're 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 still on the cutting edge and so everything that's early on is expensive 
But as this equipment gets autonomous, it becomes smaller, we're going to find that the costs for artificially um, artificial intelligence-driven farm labor will get probably even, I predict, even cheaper than the hand labor that we have today. So I'm really excited about this. I think it is truly the future, more so in, in Florida where we have crops that uh, – require a lot of hand labor. Sure. You know, if, again, if you're in the Midwest and you're growing corn and soybeans, you know, all you need is three people and a big tractor and a few a few pieces of equipment to pull behind. That's right. But it's not like that here in, in, in this uh, state. So the uh, artificial intelligence is um, ability of a machine to mimic human thinking for decision making. Um, it's been made possible primarily at the University of Florida through a couple things. Um, we began with NVIDIA, which is now one of the largest capitalized companies in this country. Uh, they make the chips that drive artificial intelligence. Uh, oh, wow. Chris Malachowski, the, the founder of that company, was a UF graduate. He donated um, what is now the, the fastest supercomputer in academia to the University of Florida. When you say it's fast, when you say fast, how fast is that? Well... I don't know. I, I hear numbers thrown around. You know, how many calculations can it do per second? It's literally millions of calculations no per wow. second, not per wow. minute. Wow. Um, the, the state of Florida uh, provided funding to hire over 100 new faculty, wow. uh, specifically dedicated to artificial intelligence. About 16 of them are devoted specifically to agriculture in all kinds of different areas. I'll uh, give you an example of one that was just approved recently. It was to help our extension agents develop systems to use artificial intelligence to answer questions. So there's all kinds of things. The easy ones are you take a picture of an insect in the field and you identify it. Sure. And you can then get recommendations for how to treat it at that particular site at that particular time of the year. But it's going to go far beyond that. It's going to be one of the things I'm excited about right now are they're called digital twins. This is where you create a farm in your computer. So all of the things that you do on the farm, all the way from the very first input to how you market crops or animals uh, later on down the stream and everything else that goes on in between. So all of your labor, all of your inputs, your soil type, climate, that all goes into that. So uh, as a farmer, if you decide to make a change, let's say you want to uh, cut back in fertilizer, fertilizer prices tripled recently and you want to cut back what does that mean for the price how much are you going to produce and what does that mean for the price and so that can predict that for you so that you can any change you're going to make on your farm you can model that first in your computer and then decide does this make sense for me or not absolutely so it's going to be i think that's going to become a really powerful tool for every farmer for um for modeling their entire operation for making good decisions. I see this agriculture is changing quickly right now. We have had first generation, obviously, we're mechanization in agriculture. The second was when we went to fertilizers back around World War II, got into genetically modified crops in the 80s and 90s, and now decision-making through artificial intelligence is that next big wave that is going to lift us up to allow us to produce more food with lower inputs and at lower cost and make more money at the same time. So it's a pretty exciting time. Florida's going to lead the way. University of Florida, the state of Florida, our producers, Farm Bureau, we're all, you know, we're in the, the driver's seat in all of this. And a lot of the rest of the country and, in fact, the world are looking to what happens here as we, as we really decide what works, what doesn't. You know, you have a passion for agriculture and telling its story and Uh, work closely with us at Farm Bureau and sharing the innovations and technologies of how UF researchers are working with our state's farmers and ranchers to sustainably grow food for the world. Why is that important? I mean, we talk about efficiencies, we talk about production, we talk about the economy, but you've also seen some other places in the world where people are hungry and they need to eat. Yeah, I come into this job really with two driving principles. The first is that farming is a business and our farmers need to make money. And so we can reduce input costs. We can help, we can help increase yields. We can't really affect uh, the price of what you sure. sell your, 
your crops or your animals for. But there are things that we can do to help make sure that um, our farmers are making enough money. Um, farming is an important part of our national culture. It's an important part of our national security. I think we all in the ag community understand that if China or Mexico were growing all of our food, that's not a good idea. Not a good thing. Yeah. Things can go bad very quickly if we lose our good relation, lose relations with those countries. So we need to be growing our more, more food, and we can do it here in Florida. Cal- California, the West, is running out of a lot of water, so there's got to be more food grown in this part of the country. And because of our unique climate for the country, I think we can do other th- some things that others can't. But, yeah, it is true that I've lived and worked in some pretty difficult places over my career, particularly in Africa, but I've also worked some in countries like Haiti and El Salvador and Honduras where there are hungry people. Yes, yeah, sure. And I think we have a, uh, you know, we have a, a moral obligation to produce food and help others produce more food when we can. Um, we're, we're very you know, blessed in this state for a lot of things are going very well for us. We do pro- sure it's a challenge, but we still produce a lot of food. And we need to produce this food to help uh, feed other people. Um, by the way, we don't, we don't give this away. We do sell it. So it is Absolutely. a business. Sure. Um, and we need to teach others how to grow more food, which um, I think is important because a lot of these countries in Africa, they could become our, our trading partners if they had better economies. And the first step out of dire poverty is simply to have enough food so that your children are healthy and, and capable of being good members of society. So it's, it's both missionary-driven that we can help and we should, and it's business driven. Uh, this is a business and we help, need to help everyone. And one other thing I would add, I mentioned national security. Uh, hungry people around the world be, do bad things. Uh, they particularly become terrorists. And I've been in countries where some of these countries you read about where there are childhood terrorists, where the fathers sell their sons into the military. Mm-hmm. And at the age of 10, you know, they become terrorists and killers. But they had no other, they didn't, you know, they needed money. You got to almost sell your children to have enough money to feed the other children. Horrible, horrible situations that no one should ever have to go through. But that is a fact of life that when you have, um, you know, when you have no other options, you tend to do desperate things. And so by having people who are better fed, I think we can have a more peaceful world for us as well. And so that increases our national security. So they're all kind of combined together. Um, business, doing the right thing, taking care of our own national security. Um, I don't, I see them all as kind of one big package, but they're all the right thing to do. No, and I appreciate your experience, sharing your experience with with me and with others, because I think it's important to to understand a, a holistic approach and viewpoint. Um, and you, you have that by your travels, by your experience and uh, with in the in each environment that you've been with, with each demographic that you've been with, uh, to be able to explain that is very very important. Here in Florida, we are unique, and we do have uh, a lot of precious natural resources, and those natural resources have some limitations. And protecting our water quality and preserving our natural resources, uh, our environmentally sound practices that Florida farmers and ranchers practice every day to protect and especially to protect our livelihood because if we don't protect that resource, it, it'll jeopardize and compromise our ability to, to remain sustainable and to be profitable. And I know Farm Bureau is a proud partner with University of IFAS uh, on recognizing farmers for their environmental stewardship with the County Alliance for Responsible Environmental Stewardship, what we often refer to as the CARES program. Tell us a little bit about some of the, these climate smart practices and their role in regard to farming today. Well, to begin with, um, farmers already do a lot to protect our natural resources, including our water. Um, we do contribute uh, to degraded water quality, sometimes to degraded natural resources. That's the nature of the business that we're in. Sure. Our goal always is to try to minimize that, but I think we, first of all, have to recognize that anytime you do anything on land, there is going to be an impact on it. Absolutely. And it's it's incumbent on us to try to do as what we can. Uh, but there is always more that we can do. And I would say when it comes to water quality, 
I don't think agriculture is the major source of degraded water quality in, in Florida. It may not even be a particularly important source, at least proportionally, but we are a part of it. Sure. So we have an obligation to do what we can to clean up our, our act where there are problems. We need to revisit their cropping practices. We need to develop new uh, best management practices for keeping nutrients on the land, and we have a lot of work going on in that area. Uh, when you're in a state like Florida, it's it, again, it's complicated because of our water moves in strange and mysterious ways in Florida. Sure it does, yeah. Uh, our soils and cropping practices are all unique and complicated and diverse. So there's no one size fits all for solutions. And again, going back to Iowa, soils are all the same. The crops are all the same. You can give one fertilizer recommendation, make sure it's right, and you're good to go. Kind of boring. But, well, I think so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why this is the, really the only state I'd be willing to do what I'm doing in right now. Uh, so we are all hands. It's an all hands on deck with this one, um, working through your CARES program, um, working with the support of our legislators. Uh, I, we, we're making very good progress right now, but the point I still want to make is we already do a pretty good job of protecting our natural resources. Farmers are, do tend to get blamed because we're, we're easy targets. We n- may not push back hard enough sometimes. You know, we all tend to hunker down and just do our jobs. That's our nature in agriculture. Probably need to be more vocal and pushing back about, well, you know, with the good science. But we're doing a we're doing a pretty good job. There's plenty of programs, Everglades, uh, the Everglades area where we have the water that goes comes off of farms is cleaner than the water that goes onto those farms in that area. So we've done an awfully good job so far. We're not done, obviously. I don't know that we'll ever be done. Uh, the other thing that's important here is how do we pay for all this? That's exactly right. And I I worry a lot about farm income. I hate it when a farmer goes out of business because they're just not making enough money. And that's that's a real threat when you don't control the price of what you sell your crops for. Uh, But I think something that's a big part of our future called payment for ecosystem services. This is where when you produce clean water, when you take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and lock it up in the soil as organic matter, when you provide for wildlife, we knew we know that a lot of cropping systems have more wildlife than uncropped systems, uh, and the list just goes on and on Absolutely. and on for the good things that sure. we do. Right now, farmers don't get paid for any of that. It's beyond no no other industry in the country does all these good things for free. Sometimes wonder what's wrong with farmers that they're so altruistic. I I hate to say this, but it's time to change that. Sure, uh, we need to be paid for the good things that. We provide to society. As I said, everyone else, they do provide good good support for the ecosystem. They get paid for it. We don't, so we need to turn that around. Um, so we have a lot of work going on right now. How do you measure those things? How do you measure yeah. improvement? How do you quantify them? How do you value them? And then how do you pay farmers for it? So I see that as a, as a part of farming's future, that we are not just growing food, but we are doing things that make the environment better. Is that something that artificial intelligence and the AI system can help to assess is the value that agriculture plays in the environment and the value that could be paid to producers for what they do that benefits and values to to society that aren't calculated now? That's a great point. And the answer is yes, because this is really field by field. And we could go, we can go into a field and we can measure all the everything that we can measure and we can come up with a value, but there are, you know, how many fields, individual fields are there in Florida? Millions probably. And we can't do it for everyone. And so we need a, a model that is based upon artificial intelligence where we take the data we have maybe for those soils and that crop and those inputs and the climate and the wildlife and the water, and we can model all that and AI can help value any changes that we see there. So AI will be critically important to that. I'll give you another example, uh, soil testing and fertilizer recommendation. We can't, we can't measure every field or what is, yeah. and, and make a recommendation for every field sure. because again, there are too many of them. Um, but if we have a field here that we have conducted some of that research on and another one 10 miles away, 
we know the soil types, we know the crops. AI can then tell us maybe how much fertilizer should be used between those two research sites. So it will provide, it will it'll be able to take existing information and then extrapolate that to environments or to fields where we've never actually tested anything. I don't, will that be perfect? Probably not, but it will be a whole lot better than what we do now where we're just guessing. Absolutely. You know, producers are involved in BMPs, we mentioned it earlier, but that's best management practices. That's things that producers do uh, to, to help in regard to procedure, practice, field activities, as well as fertilizer recommendations. And uh, that University of Florida has had a strong hand in, in helping to uh, to implement with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. With, um, with those practices, we, we also do some other things in regard to it that are beneficial. What we have, especially in not having these in, impervious surface layers and, and being developed that, that have a value to community that oftentimes I think people really do overlook and don't see. As was mentioned earlier, you talked about land values and them increasing and the, the, the maximization, the efficient use of the natural resources that we have is going to be tested. And what we're, going to, we're do, having to do from a, a global standpoint and provision of food and, and fiber is so critical and important. And here we are. We're going to have to maximize what we do. And you're learning every day. You're learning something new. And as the 4-H motto says, you know, we're making the best better. And the University of Florida is doing that and exercising and maximizing what we do possess and and making it better for the future is just, it's, it's outstanding. And appreciate the, the information that you've shared because it is, it's helpful to know. And just some, but sometimes that takes money to invest for something that's going to be better. And uh, our state legislature is known and recognized that. Our commissioner of agriculture has recognized that. And that's very helpful. Dr. Engel, what's your outlook on the future of agriculture, not just here in the state of Florida, but nationwide as well? Well, uh, as I said earlier, we got to grow more food. That's kind of the bottom line here. Our population globally is going to anywhere f- as it goes up to about 10 billion. And people want better food, it's not just sure. more people. Uh, we've got to increase food production probably by about 75% in the next 25 years. So, And there's no more land. There's no more yeah. water. How do you do that? Uh, that will be through technology growing more on the land that we already have. In fact, there may be less land in the future. In ah, Bra- I was in Brazil a couple of weeks ago, and they're taking land out of production, soybean production mainly, and putting it back into tropical rainforest. Um, and that's good production land that they're putting back into rainforest sure. for carbon sequestration reasons. So it's really uh, technology is our the only solution for how we're going to feed a, a hungry population. Um, nationally, I think the United States is in a better position than most to grow more food. We're blessed with good soils, yes. um, good rainfall in parts of the country, uh, but still an agrarian philosophy. While we're primarily an urban society, we still have a lot of people in between the coasts that understand agriculture and politicians that understand the importance of, all, of doing all this. We're going to have to grow more food here in the southeast as California runs out of water. As I said, I was in California last week, and I bet half the fields I saw were fallow because of lack of water and not because of anything else. Well, maybe government regulation, too. <laughs> uh, but we're in, you know, uh, my father-in-law is a farmer in California, and he showed me his fallow fields. He talked about the regulation that is yeah. making it very difficult for them just to do things they do even when they have enough water. So we can not count on the western part of the U.S. to grow more food. And if they do grow any food at all, it's going to be the high value, a lot of wine grapes, a lot sure. of pistachios, nut crops, things that sure. you things I that you can um, make enough money to pay for the water that you're having to pump a couple miles out of the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, my father-in-law just drilled a well three miles deep. Three miles deep, wow. Whew. Or was it 3,000 feet deep? I would say over 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 fifteen thousand feet. That's a long ways. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I don't. I don't remember, which, but it was. I was really impressed by how deep it was compared deep. to wells here. Three thousand still deep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he did tell me it cost a couple three million dollars. I remember that number to drill the well. Wow. 
that's a lot of money to drill a well. There so, has to be some value on the other end. So we don't. That's where we now have a competitive advantage. We have rain. We have good soils. We have a year-long growing season for for most of Florida, and so we gotta we gotta grow more food here. Um, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. Um, this burden's on us. If we don't, there will be hungry people around the world, and that's when the bad things start to happen. And so I, I think we all feel the pressure of having to do more, yet with all these other constraints of more people and more concern about water quality and invasive species coming in every day. So Absolutely. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an obligation, but it is opportunity the way you started this conversation. So I think, we're in, um, I think we have to do it, and we, w- and we will. Dr. Angle, I think the average age of the U.S. producer now is somewhere around 57 and a half years of age. You were not raised in agriculture. You were you were, had an, an ambition toward golf, and that ended up in being in the turf side of things and in the College of Agriculture at University of Maryland. Is there a way to be able to communicate to young people, the young Scott Angles of the world, and attract them to agriculture and some of the opportunities that it does uh, have and possess, uh, is there a way to reach them? Would, would somebody have gotten to you? Would you have had an interest if it would been apart from golf? So there are two things here. The first is that we still are going to need traditional ag production. Someone's still going to have to drive the tractor. Absolutely. Um, you know, even with autonomous driving, you, I'm not willing to have a tractor without someone watching out for I'm your with you there. your dog out front. <laughs> Um, so we still, and someone's even with robotic milkers and dairies, there's still need some control, human control in there. Um, does that need to be a four-year college degree? Probably not. Um, it's going to get more complicated. So I think we need more workforce development. That could be you know, a one or two year community college type of degree. Uh, so we're going to need that type of different type of education but then we will still have, and I think we'll probably have more of it, a need for kids coming into college who, who, who they, uh, yes, and this is what they tell me, that they don't want to come to the college to learn how to drive a tractor or milk a cow. Sure, sure. Even though we can do all of those things. Um, but what so much of this is becoming, you're the one who will fly the drone, who will program Absolutely. the robotic milker, who will monitor the data, who will make sure that AI is turning irrigation on and off at the right time. So there are much more advanced technological degrees that will be needed, and we're starting to pivot within our College of Ag and Life Sciences towards that to prepare students for this change in agriculture that is not coming, that is underway right now. It's literally happening today. So to get them ready for kind of this new model of agriculture, uh, it's a hard message to tell. A lot of a lot of young people in this coastal areas in the cities, you know, they don't even want to hear this. They don't want to hear our message. But what they do tell me is that they want to make a difference. They they want to help. They want to help people. Sure. And you ask them what that means. And you know, first of all, they say, "Well, I want to be a doctor, or lawyer." Well, first of all, I'm not sure lawyers help that many people. <laughs> but secondly, doctors. I'm, I'm sure you have no lawyers listening to this. By the way, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> But they want to be do- they want to also be medical doctors, sure. and I remind them that when you're an MD, you're treating it's one on one. You can see That's a right. dozen people during the day, and great things for them. Uh, but when you work in agriculture, you're obviously affecting a lot of people. You're making you know, millions, maybe if in the right areas. You're, you're helping billions of people, and so if you really want to look at the, the ability to change the world, change society, which they all say they want to do. Uh, agriculture will be, a, in my mind, a, a, a better and more efficient way of doing that. You know what? I'm going to add to my list. I, a teacher, a leader, a, uh, all these things. I'm going to add to it a salesman, too, because, Dr. Angle, you just you can sell me on it. That's for sure. I appreciate the, the, the vision, even for our young people, and then especially in this institution, and being able to guide them into these areas that are technologically advanced, but also to a benefit of our society. Um, society by food production, but also the preservation and efficient use of our natural resources are very important. Uh, Florida Farm Bureau's theme, Dr. Angle, for 2023 is growing forward. In your day-to-day role, how are you growing agriculture forward? I think we've already asked this, but you can be repetitive with it, but I can tell you, 
we are growing forward, aren't we, here in the state of Florida and the University of Florida? Uh, well, we'll certainly be doing that at the university level. I think others in the state, whether it's more community college programs or even certificate or, or high school programs, sure. they need to be stepping up their training in these areas. But other things like um, you know the Young Farmers Programs and, and um, FFA 4-H and the Wedgworth Group, uh, just to make sure that people are connected. We, we're a small community. That's right. There are not enough of us in agriculture. And so coming together, the Farm Bureau being the main voice of farmers in Florida, but having these connections I think is critically important to be able to um, make sure we are coordinated uh, in the types of things that we are, are promoting. Uh, we need more. Uh, we need more leaders, yes. uh, especially elected officials, That's right. uh, from an agricultural background or an agricultural community, or at least knowing a farmer, uh, taking up these leadership positions, running for office. We're lucky right now. We've got a got some strong leaders in the, the House and Senate. Yes, we are. Uh, but we won't forever. That's right. And we need to make sure that the the next part in the pun, but the next crop of young legislative leaders are getting ready to. Uh, move up into these leadership positions because this will be a large industry in the state forever. We, we, we don't have any choice. It has to remain a large industry for world stability. And we're going to need people in the legislature in Tallahassee who understand it, and D.C. as well. Well, you know what, Dr. Angle, you certainly did turn that one for me. That was a very encouraging set of words about growing our state forward. I have one question I want to ask you. This is on personal side, though. Mm-hmm. My signature is Jeb S. Smith. That's the way I sign it. S is for Scott, right. actually. And yours is J. Scott Angle. Is there any possibility that J actually stands for Jeb? No. Well, it was a mistake. So <laughs> my father's name is J. J. A. Y. My 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 name is J. A. Y. My son's name is J. J. A. Y. No. Way. His son's name. He has a two-year-old son. His name is J. My brother's name is J. It's a bad idea. Um, <laughs> you know, someone would call up on the phone, and it's J there, and you have to go through which one? The old one, the young one, the new one. So, uh, so then you just went with the Scott. Was, so how you I differentiate? just decided to go with the middle name just to avoid all that ha- to hash out. Which who do you really mean? Which here? J is that? No way. Bad I, idea. See, we learned a lot today, haven't we? We learned a lot about <laughs> Doctor Angle. Doctor Angle, is there anything else that you like to share as we wrap up this podcast? Oh uh, yeah, I appreciate your your, your friendship first of all. But also the collaboration with Farm Bureau. We're, we're, we're a hand-in-glove type of organization. You support us. Um, you tell us what you need, and we try to support you as well. And with the elected leadership, I think collaboratively and collectively listening to us as a team with all the other commodity groups. Um, I, it's one of the, the, one of the things I've really appreciated in Florida as well. We are a family, uh, sometimes a little bit dis- dysfunctional. But I think when it gets right down to it, we are all on the same page. And so it's a, it's actually a lot easier to tell our messages when everyone is not fighting against, you know, that's not, that's not your message is not my message. We all seem to have one message. And uh, the Farm Bureau is being the kind of the umbrella that holds all of that together. It's just so important. I'm, I'm really glad that we have a strong Florida Farm Bureau to lead our efforts here. Well, and I appreciate those kind words, but we appreciate your leadership. We appreciate the friendship. It is it's personal, but it's also professional. Mm-hmm. And it is a, it's an enormous benefit to have a land-grant institution that truly has the interest of all stakeholders at, uh, uh, at heart, uh, not just our, our ag industry, but all that are involved. And I know that you do that, and a lot of people can find comfort, even those that aren't necessarily pro-ag on this, this, this that maybe listen to this podcast, because I can tell you, you take objective information and allow our decision makers to make decisions with it. And that means a lot to me. It means a lot to me as a producer. And it means a lot to our the people that we do represent. And I want to say thank you for that. Well, this ends our podcast today. And thank you again, Dr. Angle, for being with us. And we hope you have a blessed, blessed rest of the day. I will. And same to you. Thank you.